morning to everyone. I think Roberta will be joining us virtually. Um, but just to say that there's a QR code on the screen. We are talking about the development of the youth on the continent, of course. It takes a village. So as our village today, please do send over audience questions. I really encourage it. Um, but this is specifically very close to my heart because where I come from in South Africa, we're commemorating Youth Month. So to be able to, you know, engage our esteemed panel on this discussion is such an honor, um, particularly on how to position Africa as a talent hub for the world, and more importantly for this beautiful continent that's alive with possibility. Welcome, Roberta. But I'll start mm -hmm. with you, Elizabeth. Um, Africa has the youngest population in the world, with 70% of sub-Saharan Africa under the age of 30, according to the United Nations. While some strides have been made in access to education and the quality of education on the continent, one of the biggest impediments is still job-relevant skills, more specifically, technical knowledge. What needs to be done to raise the job eligibility of graduates mm -hmm. and to nurture the culture of enterprise creation? Well, thanks so much for that. Thanks so much for that. I think the first thing we need to think about is pulling the, the bottom tier up by the middle. And 10 years ago, when I started my company in the Google Tech Hub, I was surrounded by graduates who had already accessed at least undergraduate education, Kenyans about to join the middle class, and all of them are thriving, starting businesses that now, today, are some of the largest fintechs and tech companies across the region. And they were already there at that time. Now those companies are employing even younger people and even more people, so the, the transfer of skills has already begun to happen. I think the single most important thing that corporates and businesses interested in the future of a workforce on the African continent can do is invest in these hubs. We have Mozilla, who's been very active on the continent, mm -hmm. who of course uh, spurred the Lalapa Fund, which is, a, which is a hub for AI innovation in South Africa and one of our clients. Mm -hmm. We also have IBM, who put the gigantic center out in uh, the outskirts of Nairobi and attracted an incredible ecosystem out there. The Meltwater Institute in Accra, Ghana, which founded this program that graduates entrepreneurs each year. These are growing a garden, not just of graduates, but of leaders that then can employ a generation. Even in my company, we've had over a thousand employees in the last decade, and of those employees, I have at least six that have started companies that have raised over $30 million. In fact, three YC, YC Combinator um, companies are run by employees in my company. So I think we need to start with the middle and invest in growing companies that can employ technical talent. Right. Um, Roberta, entrepreneurship is huge in Nigeria. Um, what should African governments and the private sector be investing more in to empower youth and to unlock sustainable development and economic growth? Thank you um, so much. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Perfect. Um, so, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this very important um, discussion. As we all know, that Africa is blessed with a very young population, 70% under the age of 30, which to me presents a great investment potential. Um, I don't see it as a ticking time bomb. I am not a pessimist. <laughs> I am an optimist, even when the situation seems to be you know, something that cannot be achieved. Um, and I believe where um, the government can play a role, um, I will give you an example, bring, linking it back to what I am doing on the continent, which is empowering and supporting and bringing the right investment to the creative and culture industries. So um, when we talk about the CCI subsectors, um, six, the UNCTAD mentions that there are 16 subsectors, um, including fashion, film, music. I see that there's tremendous growth and opportunity in these sectors. Um, and fundraising for these um, for creatives is very difficult because you know there isn't any form of tangible. It's not a tangible asset class where people can see. Okay, if you put X in, you get Y back. You know everything is based on intellectual property and people's brilliant ideas. So where the government can come in to ensure that their support is to provide grants and opportunities. I would say soft capital that is needed 
to be able to de-risk um, the investments for private sector to then come in. Because obviously, you know, um, if, if you cannot see a clear ROI, then um, government can come in with grants program. And I'm, I believe a lot of the development finance institutions are looking at this, um, looking at development banks like AfriExim that have dedicated about 500 million to supporting this sector. I believe in Nigeria, um, recently, there was a big um, announcement made by the vice, pre the, the vice president of Nigeria in partnership, I believe, with the AFDB on a, a, a fund that is going to support the creative and cultural industry. These are the types of, um, you know, platforms that need to be created and commitments that need to be made by government to be able to address this huge potential um, by creating um, platforms for entrepreneurship development, training, education. I love the previous speaker's point about um, what is happening in terms of the ecosystem of, you know, the investment ecosystem and encouraging more angel investments, encouraging more VCs to actually look at, you know, the middle. Because there's a lot that comes in for grassroots projects through development finance, and then there's a lot of investment going into big infrastructure, real estate um, opportunities, bridges, roads. But then in the middle, where I believe a huge uh, population, especially of the young people, end up sitting, there's no in investment flowing into that sector. Um, and I think that it's important to really direct some of those investments there. And the government can de-risk the first phase. So in, in our particular case, we've structured a fund that has three levels and on the first levels where we can work directly with government by through a grants platform that we've created and this grants platform is allocated for incubation and acceleration of creative and cultural industry businesses then there's an early stage ventures where private sector can come in um, and and invest via us and then a late stage infrastructure and development fund um, where we could also engage both with private sector and government. So I think we have to create models that are more agile and flexible for government to, to come in to direct flow, uh, capital flow into sectors that are not the traditional sectors for, you know, that uh, investors normally look for. Thanks. Speaking of sectors, Brian, um, Africa's youthful population offers amazing opportunity for innovation and longevity in various industries, from fintech to energy security. Which sectors are emerging as the biggest job creators on the continent and globally? Yeah, yeah I'd say it's a pretty broad list and includes what you mentioned, fin fintech, certainly green technology. You know, I'm from the Silicon Valley, so I think with the lens of technology and we see an explosion of pure tech jobs with investments by Cisco, by, by Microsoft, by Google, others, right? This core technology infrastructure, but I would argue that all companies are technology companies in, in the future. And so yes, a big that. focus on FinTech, on green tech, on, on technological innovations and in farming, right? And so we think about this very much as Elizabeth mentioned from a skills standpoint. And, and I love that Strive talks so much about this, is focus on, on skills. And so the approach we've taken stretches back many years inside Cisco. About 25 years ago, we began what we now call Cisco Networking Academy, and it was around uh, brick and mortars or working with institutions to provide certification and training for individuals initially on, on our own technology. And it was, it was good for the industry, but quite honestly, it was good for the company. But we learned along the way that if we did this the right way, it was also good for communities. And we've expanded beyond pure networking to IT essentials and emerging technologies like cybersecurity. We've trained over 18 million people around the globe in the last 25 years, about 1.6 million in Africa across 53 countries. And so as we move forward, and, and I'll note that about half a million of those were women, a big focus on women and technology roles. I think gone are the days where there's just sort of this myth of you must have that four-year degree in order to compete yes. for some of these emerging technology roles. And so again, as Drive's point, focusing on skills, well, we've made a commitment to increase that number to, to train another three million in Africa over the next 10 years. And so I think that core focus on skills development to create that economic opportunity because as we mentioned, that, that list of growing sectors is, is quite broad. Yeah, just to add on that, I mean, we had Andela, which was the first scaled code academy on the continent in Lagos, which then itself spurned dozens of YC Combinator and other companies. But I think what was interesting there is students that came out of that academy, who they were already um, tested in. So it wasn't the bottom, it was the middle, as Roberta said. They had to be tested in, not from schooling, but actually just 
capability. And once they came out of that academy, they were commanding salaries of up to $7,000 a month, which for a 24-year-old in Lagos was quite exceptional. Mm -hmm. And those were salaries on par with California. But I think what we saw was not that the students were incapable or the workforce wasn't there. What we saw then was the employer's shock that they would have to pay the same price. So I think it brings us to the other point, which is, you know, are we ready for Africa to become what it is, you know, and, and show the world that we deserve these salaries and the talent is there. I think there's almost a conundrum where we're growing the talent, they're commanding the salaries, and then global corporates are, are not expecting to pay that same level. They're looking to see this is a low income workforce. And I think that needs to be challenged from the very start. I agree. Ready or not, I mean, the, Africa is rising, and, and you're right, people need to be challenging those entry-level salaries, right? Um, sticking with you, Elizabeth, many say the tech sector is able to create jobs, but we're, all seeing, we're also seeing automation uh, a lot on the lower-level skilled jobs and uh, the need for people that are highly trained, particularly when we're focusing on artificial intelligence. What are the opportunities there? Same, same point to be made here. I mean, we use ChatGPT, we use some other AI models, we have chatbots all over our site. It's not that that's going to take away low-income jobs. It's, going to create, it's also going to create mid-level and high-income jobs. Who's creating the algorithm? Who's monitoring and editing it? I had an analyst just yesterday hand me something from, clearly from ChatGPT, which looked like something an 11-year-old could do. And I said, you need to put more thought into this, critical thinking into this, strategic analysis into this, and most importantly, decision-making. The thing that I say to my team almost every day on Slack is, somebody else besides me can make a decision. These are leadership skills. These are things that European students and American students and Asian students get to do through a decade of internships. Who is paying for the decade of internships on the African continent? Mm. I had eight internships alone during my study abroad years before I even began my first job in investment banking, which then paid for a very rigorous training course. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to really understand that we can replace the, the base income jobs with AI, but who's curating, editing, and analyzing what's coming out of the AI? Because as an executive, I don't want that bare minimum output. And that, again, goes back to we can't just expect that to automate the continent or low-income jobs. We need to train the African workforce, and it's already being trained, mm -hmm. the training themselves on the mid-level management, executive management decisions to pull up the rest. Yeah, I love what you said about the algorithms at, at core. I think there's definitely a role for Africa to play to be a, a instrumental in designing these systems of AI and machine learning in the future. So we need to be generating more AI and ML analysts and specialists because it's all about data and it's all about the alg algorithms at core and the data or the outputs are only as good as the data that goes in right and so there's very easy for bias to enter the system for example i tried this this morning if i picked up my phone right now and googled beautiful baby try this <laughs> google beautiful baby you'll immediately get some pictures of some beautiful babies but they don't look like me or many of the people on the sub-saharan african continent right yeah. so just one example of how bias can sneak into the system so we must be mm -hmm. thinking about training the future technologists in africa but also playing an instrumental role in designing the ai data sets of the future that will drive these new technologies True. I'd I mean, like to jump in here and highlight the work of the lapa because i believe you're training um models on languages in African, um, I think in South Africa. So I think it's really adapting the current cu culture and technology into fitting what we are here, doing here on the continent. So just adapting it a bit, it's also quite important. Um, and that is why we need to always, when we talk about content, we need to talk about content that is relevant also to the African continent and not just taking a model, an international model, and trying to force fit it on the continent. So that's very important. Just dovetailing from what Brian just said. True, context. Um, Roberta, digital penetration is taking off in Africa. Morocco, right where we are, had an internet penetration that exceeded 80%, making it the country with the highest internet penetration in Africa. How can young people or, or the youth monetize that? I believe um, 
you know, when you talk about internet um, um, penetration and access to um, internet, access to connectivity and online platforms, I believe that youth on the continent are already taking advantage of this. Um, again, because I'm biased for the creative and cultural industries, I'll bring it back into our industry. <laughs> um, if you look at what is happening in terms of e-commerce, you know, during COVID-19, when everything stopped, um, African creatives took the opportunity to explore different platforms to showcase their work. So e-commerce basically became um, something that was very common. I believe a lot of uh, designers even showcase their work using online platforms. Social media platforms such as Instagram became very popular um, in showcasing and even selling um, um, their work, which really kind of goes to show the resilience of, of, of CCI subsectors and basically directing the narrative of cultural currency, right? Um, and I see that a lot of, um, you know, the young people in Africa are already um, using platforms, Instagram cryptocurrencies became very popular, um, using um, uh, Metaverse even as a, <laughs> as a way to showcase. We actually did a program during COVID called Recycle, Rework, Reuse, where we selected five designers from different um, West African countries. Um, they stayed in country because at that time, during lockdown, no one could travel, um, but they were able to communicate using, you know, um, internet, they formed groups, they created a collection together. They found a way to showcase this collection online and even sell their product online. And these are tremendous opportunities, you know, when you talk about, you know, um, young people using platform internet and you know opportunities internet and um 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 technology you know to be able to showcase their work um another thing that i could talk about is netflix you know when um um during covid as well you know you could show the resilience of the cci subject sectors when the the the, the revenue of uh, platforms like netflix um and um what is the other one um is it Amazon Prime and, and others actually shot up? Because these are all showing that the creative and cultural industries can actually utilize technology and other plan, um, platforms to be able to accelerate the growth um, of these sectors. Can I make a comment on this? So yesterday in one of the work, uh, breakouts, the CEO of the AFC fund said, all we need to do is give access to energy, power, and access to the internet and let it go. Yeah. I think this continent has suffered so much from overprescription and too tightly controlled programming of exactly how we should do it. Yeah. And when and in Silicon Valley and in many other places around the world, we've seen the bare minimum given to young people and let them just go play and go free. And I think, you know, it shouldn't really be overthinking it about how exactly do we prescribe. We can just give the resources and go. I mean, we've seen in development direct cash transfer is one of the most successful ways to increase the productivity and income of a community. And it's the same thing, direct resource transfer and let these young people go. And I think, you know, you can't stop the emergence of all the entrepreneurs that are happening with the bare resources. So why not show what they can do with just a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. so just put in the investment and let them go wild on the innovation, right? Brian, um, we've got an audience question. Thank you very sure. much. How can IT and artificial intelligence skills be taught better in traditional schools or institutions in Africa? So I'd say that there's going to be a natural displacement of some roles, as Elizabeth mentioned, at the lower end of the spectrum. That's just going to be natural. And so we've got to be thinking very deliberately about how we're training at an early age for these future skills. Call centers, technical assistance centers, uh, secretarial admin, certainly some of those roles might be diminished or a, a smaller number of people can take on additional tasks. But I think it's going to be key to providing that technology education early on, focusing on STEM education in the secondary schools leading in. By the time folks get to those high school, or we call it high school in the US, or to university levels, it may be too late. Focusing on the tech skills through things like the Cisco Networking Academy, focusing on certifications. And I'd say even for those who do have the opportunity to go to university, you're not done, right? The technology is changing so fast, there's still gonna be a need to focus on certifications. And so I don't think it's possible to start too young. I think we should be focused on the continent and that's early science, technology, engineering, and math education in the curriculum at a very early age. And maybe also the curriculum should 
reflect the workforce, which is an Definitely. agile way. So we should Definitely. be teaching in short form courses Definitely. in agile blocks of time to understand as opposed to you know a year long course with the same kind of test at the end. I think it doesn't prepare one for a technical team. Definitely. And perhaps also experiment with the platforms um, that people use when it comes to teaching at a very early stage, right? Sure. No longer is it that people need to be boxed in with the chalkboard. There's so many platforms, so many ways to be teaching yeah. young minds and elevating and, and stimulating that curiosity. Totally agree. And taking, fact, taking advantage of the fact that so much of the continent is connected with, with mobile devices. Okay. So we sponsor a Cisco um, Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award through Global Citizen each year. And the winner this year is from Zimbabwe, Kosana um, Musuku is his, his name. And he runs an organization called Sciency. He was a STEM teacher in Zimbabwe for about three years mm -hmm. and realized that he was having trouble getting this technology education par primarily to the students in the rural schools. And he created this app and platform called Sciency, which is mobile based, but provides opportunities for teachers to provide that STEM education in the ways that you mentioned, right? That's easily to digest by those students. Examples, just, just one example of many ways that, to your point, we have to focus on how best to deliver that content to these populations. Right, Roberta. I mean, we are trying to develop young people who are worldly, people for the world, people who, as we've said uh, on this particular panel, preparing, a, uh, positioning Africa to be a hub for talent, right, for the world. But once we've trained young people, they've gotten training elsewhere, how do we attract them back onto the continent for the much needed skills, you know, to elevate um, the region as well? Yeah, definitely, because I think um, the continent is facing a serious problem of um, brain drain. So, and this has got to do with a mindset of scarcity. Um, we are blessed with human capital on the continent and abundant resources. Um, so I believe there's a, a huge opportunity for young people like myself to come back to the continent to support the development and growth of the continent. And I think we need to make it an attractive destination um, I see that there are lots of, I'll give a few examples of what is happening on the continent. In my country, Ghana, um, just in 2017, we launched something called the Year of the Return, which was an opportunity not just for um, the, our brothers and sisters in the diaspora to come in and just see the beautiful things that the continent has to offer, but also to, to sit down and see how the continent connection to the diaspora is very, very much important in the development of you know, the African continent. So these things are, these platforms and initiatives have helped in propelling you know, the return of, of the diaspora. And I've seen multiple um, engagements. You know, there's an, a platform called MyPA, there's the Haram Base, um, there's the African Leadership University that are also having significant programming to, to support and build talent to be able to meet the demand, you know, of um, growing opportunities here on the continent. And even in our subset, in, in CCIs and in, the found, in my foundation and the fund and what we're doing, um, we're looking at ways in which we can connect businesses in the diaspora with businesses in the con on the continent and finding ways in which we can create platforms for them to engage, to invest, to, to learn more about the culture, because if you look at, um, you know, cases, I'll give case studies like Benna Boy and your Thames and people in the music and, and film industry and how they're doing so well in the diaspora. You know, they are con from the continent, but they're doing exceptionally well. Benna Boy just sold out his show. These are just examples of how, um, you know, the world is really looking at the continent when it comes from a standpoint of content and we can lead in that as well, and we can set the pace. I always talk to people about sustainability. When we talk about sustainable development, I believe that the continent can lead the effort when it comes to sustainability. Um, we can create avenues um, for different industries, right, to erupt a renaissance of sorts, you know, um, and very, very industries that are not so typical, um, that are not so, um, uh, you know, uh, we can lead, uh, be the, at the forefront of such industry. Um, so I think that Africa has a, a great role, Africa has a, a great role to play in propelling industries that are not so traditional yeah. and um, basically setting the, and charting a path for ourselves and driving our own growth and prosperity. 
You know, Elizabeth, I uh, manage a newsroom in Johannesburg and Cape Town, and post-pandemic, it's been very difficult to convince the younger reporters that it's, it's, you should come into the office. They're like, no, I can work from anywhere. How do we then leverage some of the opportunities that we got and the lessons that we gained from lockdowns um, in the pandemic so that young people um, see opportunity in being able to upskill themselves wherever they are? Yeah. I, again, we can look to, again, we can look to agile methodology for an answer. I mean, my engineering team fought to not come into the office years before COVID. And the reason we allowed them to do it is there's a highly accountable way to manage engineering remotely. And, you know, daily stand-ups and bite-sized work and, you know, very measurable success. And I think if we take those work methods and team methods and apply them to the rest of the company, in fact, I had my finance and accounting team sit in on the agile meetings to learn a bit more how to have efficient meetings. I think you can take those learnings and change what a workforce looks like. And it's not a disadvantage, it's just different. And I think the most important way to in retain talent in these markets is to retain salary levels. Mm -hmm. If you go abroad and study and make a certain level of money, even if you move home to be near your family, you don't want to half your salary. And, you know, it was quite controversial when our company was paying the same salary rates at all of our offices, Madrid, London, Lagos, Accra, Kampala, and Durban and you know we really up the salaries in a lot of markets and we levelize them there is a ban there might be some cost of level increase in certain markets but we have to think about Africa as a high income destination if we wanted to produce and one of uh, one of my friends runs a weaving cooperative called Kayung in Dakar Previously, maybe 10 years ago, they would have gone to France if they had success. Now Chanel did a show in Dakar, and the, the rug that they wove is now in the atelier in Paris. And using Instagram, and using remote work, and using social media and technology, they are living a happy middle-class life in Dakar with their friends. They're thriving, they're living their best life, and they don't need to move to Paris. And I think you know when we start to see these capitals thrive, retaining the income, then we'll see the diaspora stay. And we use a recruiting company called Move Me Back, which is run by an awesome diaspora abroad. And I think the success of that has, has really shined in the last five years. Can I add, add to that and say first that I, I love Roberta, yeah. gave so many shout outs to Burner Boy. That was awesome <laughs> doing that. But let me also add that, that the world is forever hybrid. In a lot of ways, COVID taught us that, you know, this remote work was a great equalizer. We were able to, to move the, a lot of the jobs from the major population centers and spread them out across the globe. And that will always be the case. I think for those of us who are farther along in our careers, we've got the option to be able to do that and be quite successful. The threat will be to the younger generation who, for whom skills and technological skills and core subject matter expertise is important, but equally important were those lessons that they frequently previously learned from being in the office and shadowing more senior folks and having the, the water cooler discussions, we say, and some of that goes away in a completely hybrid and disper dispersed environment. So we've got to be thinking as talent developers how we're focusing deliberately on not just those core technology subject matter expertise skills, but also the softer skills of the dynamics of being young in the workforce. And so something for us to be focused on. What are some of the skills, and this is the last question, unfortunately, sure. um, that, are re that can be developed, you know, um, and this is for everybody on the panel. What are some of the critical skills that can be developed on the continent so that the rest of the world begins to really see and take Africa seriously as a talent hub? I would say some of that just naturally happens. Roberta talked about this, uh, the scarcity mindset. I think just naturally, given the population di demographic shifts over the next several years, it's naturally going to happen when by 2030, the continent has a, a quarter of the world's population and a third of the world's workforce. I think we're going to be naturally taken seriously by all companies, not just as a producer of talent and exporting, but also every major corporation from around the globe needing to do business on the continent. And so keeping up and, and leading the way around the technology skills that advance these new um, developments, I think it's going to be important, but I think a lot of it happens organically. Exactly. I see literally no difference in the capability of my team members that are based in East, West, Southern Africa, or continental Europe, or the UK. I, there's no difference. They're all silly 22-year-olds when they come in, and all, <laughs> you know, awesome managers five, six years later. Yeah. So I think you know, it's just investment and confidence, mm -hmm. and just practice. 
Roberta? Yes, I, I believe it's confidence and also positioning and packaging, right? Yeah. So um, I, I deal with a lot of young entrepreneurs, especially women here on the continent in training and mentorship. And we just recently finished an incubator and I can tell you that it's the lack of confidence because a lot of them don't even know what to ask for in terms of salary or even if they're creating a collection, like you said, they don't even know how to price it because they believe that by default, being on the continent means that you have to give a discount. So really, it's about building the confidence of young people. So I believe that a lot of these entrepreneurship programs, a lot of these uh, skills development programs should actually have a module on building one's confidence and be basically psychologically decoding how we are brought up and how we think about ourselves so that we can actually project a more confident um, demeanor when we are negotiating, when we are asking for pay, when we are asking for investment, when we are asking you know, for, um, you know, or pricing our product. So that is very, very important. And um, I, I remember when I first moved to the continent, so I'm a, an example of, I went to school in the state, I work with the UN, I, I live in New York. Um, I went to one of the best schools, studied as a scientist. You know, I have a master's in biotech from Georgetown University. And moving back to the continent, um, when I started my business and I was going into different, you know, um, clients and pitching, they were like, oh, but you're a young lady. You are in your early 30s. Why do you think you need this kind of salary or this kind of commission on a transaction? I'm like, well, I deserve it. I'm putting in the same effort as my male counterpart. So I don't see why I should price differently. So it's really about building that confidence. Um, and we need to help young population really develop that confidence. And I think having social media and access to technology and being able to see what someone in, is pricing in Japan is also a great opportunity. So we need to really invest in spaces where we can have those cross kind of um, 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 discussions and, and collaborations so that we can learn from other cultures and to see how others are doing things and then really position ourselves to be more competitive globally. Thank you so much for your time. It was a riveting conversation. Thank you to my esteemed panel as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.